Peter Hicks and John Heinstein are members of a group called Sleepy Driver. They're based out of Fredericton, but they have an international audience. Our conversation was fast, funny, and touched on the creative process, as well as what it's like to be an artist, musician, living in New Brunswick, making your craft, and making a living. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Hey, you're welcome. I really appreciate this. Um, you've just launched a new CD. The most obvious place to start is with launching the CD, and then we'll get into other things. Sure. So you, um, I'll hold it while you talk. Yeah. Well, Sugar Skull, which is uh, which is really our fifth uh, album, and uh, may, maybe even number six if you include the, the an EP that we had uh, out originally. So we've been uh, yeah back in two thousand nine we put out Steady Now, and then a couple years later it was in a low dark light. A couple years later after that it was uh, Ignatius and uh, and the Light Sleeper EP. We did a uh, an instrumental album earlier this year called Decomposed, and then uh, Sugar Skull, so. Good. And you did a gig just last weekend to launch your new CD. It was in Fredericton. How'd, how'd that yeah. go? It was a double gig, actually, and it went really well. We thought we'd do something a little bit different from our, the typical CD release, so we gathered together a number of musicians who we played with over the years, and many of whom had contributed on, our, on this album and previous albums. Yeah. And uh, so it was kind of a, a kitchen party of sorts, <laughs> spanning two days, and... Uh, yeah, so we, we brought them in for some of their tunes, and then they would play on on our tunes, and it was a real celebration of mm -hmm. all the, the music that we had done over the last decade. It's fun. And yeah. while we're talking about CD, where can people go find it, buy it, uh, download it? Yeah, well, uh, as, as far as locally in, in Fredericton, Backstreet Records, Tony's Music Box, and Sunrise Records up in the Region Mall. Okay. And and, and always uh, find it uh, on our Bandcamp camp site where you can get it uh, digitally as well as uh, order a CD. Uh, the typical streaming sites, Spotify, iTunes, and things of that nature. Yeah, and Driver.ca will take you to all of those sources mm -hmm. too. Okay. And, and then in St. John Backstreet Records. Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. um, it's the Maritimes. We have that culture of music. Mm -hmm. But... We're starting to develop the culture of supporting the music. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and to actually buy local in a different format from your vegetables and <laughs> stuff, right? Um, how does that go? Um, w I'm imagining it would be fun that you could make your full time living from this. Although I don't, maybe you don't want to, but mm. a lot of musicians, you know, it'd be nice to do this full time. Mm. But when interviewing Tom Swift, for example, mm -hmm. Um, the amount of time you have to spend on the road, and he's a single person with, you know, with six or seven whatever guitars. And yes, yeah. Paul and you guys on the road's a whole other story. Yes, yeah. yeah. So it, wh what's that like, the, the business side of being um, an alternative rock band? Or mm -hmm. cause you guys don't fit description very well. No, no, <laughs> from from a genre, we, we, we actually consciously... Uh, try not to fit ourselves into a particular genre, mainly because the uh, with with six people in the band, the influences are so varied, right? So we we yeah. try and get something that, uh, in in a lot of cases, our albums are like a mixtape. You know, they're they're, <laughs> they're uh, something that covers everything from folk to to rock, college rock, uh, you know, country in some places. So I mean, it's a it's really interesting in that regard. From a, from a business perspective, I think that we've been. Um, because we're we're six people who all have careers. Uh, besides, uh, you're you're bang on in saying you know the 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 finances of uh, of of going on the road and trying to make a living for six people is 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 pretty tough. Yep. Uh, any way you slice it, I mean, at any level of popularity, you can read lots of stories about people who are even. Uh, you know, a full-time musician and a household name in Canada, and they're they're still uh, you working. know, <laughs> yeah, working, working very, hard. very, very hard as yeah. as a solo artist. So you start uh, considering the uh, the economics of uh, of six people and making a career. It's just not. Uh, I don't think it's very feasible. Um, just because the for all of us with, as I say, our our careers. You'd have to make a lot of money at at uh, at music in order to make the same level of income as all of these folks in in the IT professions and yeah. things like yeah. that. So, yeah, yeah. I think we all made the conscious choice at the very beginning of the band that this wasn't going to be a touring band. It was we were primarily interested in putting out really good music and being connected into the music scene in some way that we could. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you set your ambitions too high. 
you know, unrealistically so, then that's yeah. that's a good recipe for the band falling apart. And I think mm -hmm. it's testimony to our approach that we're still together after, well, over 10 years, really, if yeah. you go back to the core band of three people, mm. which started back in, what, 2003, possibly? 2005, yeah. 2005, yeah. 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 We all had more hair and were darker. And <laughs> well, I didn't have more hair, but <laughs> oh, fun! The, um, when you talk, so you're one of your websites. You've got mm -hmm. the sleepydriver.ca, I think, it's yes. website. Mm -hmm. But you got this other one called Bandcamp. Yes, yeah. yeah. Which of course will hearken for a lot of viewers. The mm -hmm. you know forty year old. No, which one is uh, American Pie? Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. One time at Bandcamp. One, one time at band camp. Yeah. Yeah. You guys can have yeah. a T-shirt with you know one time at Bandcamp. Mm. Sleep a driver. Well, Bandcamp is is a, is an interesting thing that started off, um, you know, really as a as a way. I I I don't know who exactly started it, but it, I think it's been very instrumental in establishing uh, independent artists and uh, allowing people to do it themselves because uh, record labels have you know their rosters have gotten smaller and smaller and smaller over the years and uh and i think that a lot of artists were finding that in order to make it uh, they really needed to cut out the record labels that were taking you know they would do their advance but uh you yeah. know it's 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 basically a, a mortgage on on your career you have to make it all talent. back before you uh yeah. are uh you know being paid by the record labels yeah. so and it ties into the whole ability to record an album from top to bottom by yourself in your basement which is mm -hmm. something an approach that we've done mm -hmm. you know all of the all of the recording that we have done happens in one or other of our basements the gear is high quality but portable we can move it around to various locations and uh, and then take the time that we really want to take to produce music that we, we really want we don't have someone saying well you've got to kind of hit this genre or you know target this audience mm -hmm. uh, you know we we sort of uh, just go about things in whatever way that we think uh, yeah. what you know, feels makes right. sense at the time, whatever <laughs> yeah. feels right. But, yeah. but yeah. how wonderful, yeah. eh? Well, mm. When reading um, stories of different musicians over the decades, so mm. biography surfacing. I um, mm. haven't read it yet, want to, is the Johnny Mitchell's mm. new one that's mm. um, yeah. Untamed something, I think it's called. It. Anyway, but in there, there's sections about how sh they couldn't peg her, and she didn't want to be pegged, because mm -hmm. yeah. industry wants to get hold of and now with new technology, even doing the show, you know, mm. two little 4K cameras, um, good sound, um, yes, lots yeah. of talent that can edit it and then mm -hmm. do social media for it. And away you go. Mm. So do you have a sense then of your metrics, which is like a new question mm. in the music world. So do you have a sense of how far your music has gone worldwide, given that, you know, oh, you throw it out there? The world, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. It's, it's, it is interesting because you, you know, search engine optimization i mean <laughs> we will look at that and any site that you uh uh set up whether it's facebook our own website or bandcamp you can you can see who's accessing it and from where so you can you can get a you know a real time report on on all of those things and so we are getting hits from all around the world we're getting sales from all over the world and and things like that uh but even you know that's 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 just from having uh websites that are available um on a more conscious level for us we have done uh different campaigns into the u.s or into uh europe uh specifically for uh for our music so we've we've consciously sent our our music to lots of djs and uh media outlets uh, in in europe to uh and and the u.s to try and have a little a bit of penetration there and see yeah. how well we do um i tell you canada has been great to us uh cbc is is wonderful campus and community right across uh us is a tougher nut to crack we've we've you know spent a lot of money and time trying to figure that one out and, yeah. and we've had various levels of success there's uh, they have their americana music uh charts which one year we we cracked um, you know, their top 100 and that was that was that took a lot of effort and uh, won't don't mind saying a lot of money uh, I think that the the tougher thing there is there are so many established artists mm -hmm. in, in the United States that uh, that you you're competing with 
everyone right on up the chain you know if, yeah. if there's an album from willie nelson you're competing against that for for radio uh play yeah. you go across the pond over to uh to europe and um, the market is completely different um you aren't necessarily competing with uh, a lot of the bigger la labels because um they they have such a hunger to discover new things and new artists and things and so we've we've charted on the euro americana charts we've had you know print reviews and and interviews and things with uh different things over in the ne netherlands and belgium and germany and things so it's a uh, it's really interesting to to see how um not how people just how people are accessing us on the internet but how people are embracing us you know from a from a dj and you know, media yeah, perspective. Yeah. For Just someone on, in the Netherlands, we're not a local band in Fredericton. We're yeah, there. yeah. <laughs> we're a band with a presence on the internet, and therefore there's not that those distinctions that you get mm, in yeah. maybe the traditional yeah. music scene. It, it'll be ages ago now in technology terms, but out of the Fredericton High School a while ago, a while ago, two decades ago maybe, it was uh, Zach Atkinson and his Dionysus Punch. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Didn't they win some sort of online contest as some sort of the best new rock band? And it was in Fredericton but they were competing like all over the world and of course here would make local news but mm, mm -hmm. it has that flavor to it and then that openness to it which then invites all the work that goes on <laughs> to maintain mm -hmm. that so do you guys do all that work on your own do you divvy it up and you do social media or you do this part of social media or yeah well we certainly play to the strengths of uh of everyone in the band and, and different people depending on um uh, what they have on the go they you know have different capacity for it yeah but uh with with every album we've had you know and this goes down to the probably the the it and project manager uh yeah. <laughs> things that we have as as day jobs but you know we, we have our task lists lists and things that uh that yeah. uh, people are to do you know so <laughs> you get to mail these John's great with uh, with web, so he's established our web presence and things like that. Right. So yeah, yeah, because I could picture you know if you've got so many of the CDs printed mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then you do a mail order mm -hmm. sort of things like that TV commercial of a dings once and you've sold one and yeah. dings ten yeah. times and then yeah. there's ten thousand mm -hmm. you're sitting in your garage <laughs> stuffing envelopes for yeah, that, three, <laughs> that, three that, that's exactly yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm I'm tired of that taste of the uh, <laughs> of the envelopes. Oh, that technology for that. Yeah, thing. they do. But yeah. you keep licking it. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> We're surprised with every album that people are still buying physical physical album so mm, you know yeah. it's expensive to send a, a cd to the netherlands or germany mm. and and we do do that even though our music is available elec electronically and so we, yeah. we've certainly seen a change since our first album in 2009 i guess and our our current album today and the in the way that people purchase yeah. uh, their music and we, we still do see physical albums being sold and there's maybe even more more LP is being sold now. So yeah. we've had people ask us, when are you going to put this out on vinyl? Especially mm. with this cover art here, yeah, which yeah. is yeah, well, something that the Peter did. That's that's a painting of, of Peter's. Oh, which, you're one of those. Yeah, you're a yeah. Too. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Oh. So it's got that feel of the kind of classic '70s album art with, uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> look how King, painted. look how King Crimson here. Yeah, comes yeah, the yeah exactly. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, some of those old Yes album covers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah and, it really and does it's that. fascinating to listen to you guys because of the language because of calling it an album mm. you know so it's like all those different technologies are mm. still part of the language so an album and most people know what you're talking mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. cd and then but download download just yeah the, yeah you know, from software if that's what you even call it downloads nowadays so yeah so you're left with that challenge of all these different ways you've got to get your music out mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. i mean we've we've even had extended discussions about is the concept of an album something that really matters anymore mm -hmm. a lot of people are releasing individual songs two or three tunes at a time mm -hmm. you know various live versions of something that was recorded off the web is now you know legitimately a release by yeah by some people and, and we're we were born in a different generation so <laughs> yeah. we still have like very deeply ingrained that idea of an of an album which puts out a formal idea about where you are at that point what your ideas are where your music wants to go there it's a philosophical statement as much as as it is a musical mm. statement mm. Yeah. and so we're still kind of bound to that idea and we, we like it too i mean you can 
you can group a whole set of actions around the idea of an album release with a sequence of of tunes right it's hard to have a cd release for one song yes you know? yeah. but uh you know you get a little bit of momentum with all of the members in the band and the people around you when you've waited for two years and you release another kind of chunk of music yeah yeah part of what you describe um makes me want to go to the next question which is one of voice Mm -hmm. uh, so in the jock world, a team will form at the beginning of the year based on trades and all. And somewhere in the first six weeks, they form their identity. Or mm -hmm. when they're not, you'll hear announcers kind of going, well, they haven't found who they are yet. Mm -hmm. the, the same thing is with music and especially six units, six people or seven get, you know, as guests come in. Mm -hmm. So somewhere along the way, you guys have found your voice. Mm -hmm. Can you describe that process? Is that too weird and awkward a question? Because somewhere along your evolution, you went, this is our sound. Because mm -hmm. you were talking about concept albums. Mm, yeah. So, and, and this is what we're saying now. And then two years later, this is what we'll be saying here. Mm. It's probably like any, uh, like any artistic endeavor. It's partly conscious and partly unconscious. And I think maybe a, a large part of that is go, going in with, uh, you know, we're, we're older musicians, so we've come in with a whole body of experiences. We, we know what we don't like in a, in a band experience. And so there's, there's really a push toward everybody kind of getting along and playing well together and excelling in their various strengths. And, and so Peter will come, the, the typical process of, of working on a song is Peter will write the song, the lyrics on an acoustic guitar. Uh, we come into practice. We have limited time, so our practices are efficient. We get right down, <laughs> right down to brass tacks. And, is, is that one yeah. of your roles? <laughs> no, no it's, uh, like it. it's Peter and, and our drummer, Barry. Yeah, 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 Barry, yeah, yeah. Barry is quality control, and <laughs> <laughs> Peter is the project manager. Yeah. <laughs> you and the rest of us just are, are very compliant, easygoing people. So Yeah, yeah and, and so he'll come into the uh, into the band room with, uh, with an acoustic guitar and a set of lyrics and and just start playing, and then, then we will all come around that tune and you never really know what's going to come out you know mm. you can you can take a, a song on an acoustic guitar that sounds like a yeah. maybe a soft mellow waltz type thing and suddenly it's turned into this aggressive rocker because mm. of whatever has happened in the you know in that experience of everybody starting to play at once yeah. and uh yeah it's a it's a really really interesting experience it would be almost an interesting thing to put out an album of those kind of experiences. Of. <laughs> yeah. Well, well it's, but you, yeah, it's, you know, to push it into the spiritual realm, you're mm. talking about play, mm -hmm. human mm -hmm. beings learning to play together, whether it's mechanically on the instrument, but you're talking about the intangible that you mm -hmm. can't describe. Tapping That's right. Something, something just or, went click, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, because all performers go through that moment where <laughs> it was bigger than the sum of the parts, mm. one of those mm -hmm. things. Yeah. And there was, because it's music, there's this resonance thing that happens. Um, there is, yeah. Right, right there, whack, whack. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you know? for sure. Yeah. Be, and, and, it, and it's bang on with that because, you know, I might write the chords and, uh, you know, the melody and, and the lyrics, but it's the band that arranges it and the, the band that creates the song out, out of that. And... Um, you know the different musicians in the band and uh, may as well like name them too because ethan young lie who's on lead guitar and synthesizer dave palmer who's on pedal steel mike hathaway on bass barry hughes on drums john heinstein on keys um as soon as you start to play a tune counter melodies and and things like that start to come out of the different instruments and and it and it gels into you know this being unto itself you know it, it, it starts as one thing yeah. you know which is really uh, you know the infant if you will and and uh, and it grows into something that's fully formed and fully yeah. you know realized yeah. we've been playing together so long that we're used to listening to each other so mm -hmm. you know you're not just trying to contribute a part but you're hearing all of the things that are happening around you and uh, yeah. and it's you know, we're create, creating arrangements on the fly, yeah. I think. Yeah, it'd be uh, like yeah. you, you're sitting there, so I can picture Barry sitting behind with the drums kind of holding it together yeah. and thinking, oh, John's in that mood today. <laughs> <laughs> Peter's in that mood today. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's go here. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. then turn the boat a little bit. And mm. Yeah. Somebody was playing the wrong notes, and I'm not quite sure who it is, but he's <laughs> sitting over there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a typical Barry Hughesism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, something's yeah. not quite right. Yeah. It's, the closest. 
not here. It's not here. It's yeah. right here. Yeah. <laughs> I think a good analogy to that process is if you're playing with a sports team and a bunch of guys that you've played with, um, you know, f for years, and you just have a certain understanding of how all of the, all of the pieces fit together, and you kind of get into that groove where you're not necessarily thinking consciously about it but you're definitely drawing from all of these patterns that you've sort of built up over yeah. over time and those patterns extend outside yourself they extend to all of the people that you've been playing with and uh yeah and something comes out of it yeah, yeah the more you play together the easier that process gets mm. um, yeah. this would be a great spot could you introduce one of the tunes off of um your new cd and we'll splice that in here for maybe 30 40 seconds sure uh <coughs> well uh our lead off track from Sugar Skull was The Last Heart, which is a, a great example of how um, songs grow and evolve. Um, with uh, the previous release, uh, an EP, uh, The Light Sleeper was, uh, was out and there was an acoustic version of uh, The Last Heart on that. And so you, if you go to uh, Sleepy Driver site, you're able to listen to the acoustic version of The Last Heart and uh, and then on sleepy driver sugar skull you're able to uh, hear the full band version of the last heart see how it evolves mm -hmm. great yeah so here's oh sorry Go ahead. And, and listen to dave palmer's solo in that i think that is one of the most transcendent pedal steel <laughs> solos and dave is coming from a country background but he's kind of plugging into more of a, a rock style delivery uh, of that and he plays pedal steel in ways that you don't necessarily hear that's great. So here's a few moments of The Last Heart from Sugar Skull.
wanted to ask this ever since listening to you guys in the first place and getting some of the CDs and looking at the lyrics. Maybe it's an odd question, but is there a religious influence when you write your songs sometimes? Um, well, that's that's a that's a great question. I think that there can be. Um, it's it's not it's not religious in the sense of um, you know a, a worship sense as 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 much as. Uh, if you look at a lot of the the songs, and I know specifically you know, because people have asked me, you know, are 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 these religious songs? Uh, there's one called "Get Right with the Lord." There's there's one uh, you know, that's called uh, the the doubt, which is uh, the chorus is "Jesus, come on down." Uh, but if you look further, like to the next line of uh, of that song, it's "Jesus, come on down, let's settle this," and the the whole chorus is uh, about all the trials and tribulations uh, that you know a person has been through, uh, and essentially you know getting tired of it, and you know <laughs> like if if this is if if this is what you know belief is getting me, then yeah. you know like you know kind of like I don't want it, you know that that type of thing. Yeah. So I think it uh, and get right with the Lord is is not uh, a, a call to you know get right with the Lord, and um, but as much as it's uh, it's actually a murder ballad type of tune where you know you better get right with the lord because i'm about to shoot you down you know like yeah. that type of thing okay. so there I, I i think that that comes from um you know some of the uh the old school country there's always a a, a slight gospel influence uh to that but so calling a, upon imagery and and maybe some of those old belief structures mm -hmm. but actually questioning them and and having fun with them you know turning them around a yeah. little bit and saying that it's it's not all black and white there's any belief system i think has has lots of gray in yeah. there too yeah. so yeah. or moments of doubt not it's not all just sunshine and yeah. roses yeah, yeah. 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 society is steeped in judeo-christian metaphor i guess so, mm. you know it's a it's kind of a shorthand for very powerful ideas and concepts so mm. when you you know, say something like "get right with the Lord." That has resonances through history and in everybody's conscience, and not necessarily a religious statement, so much as a statement that people immediately understand what you mean by "you better get right, but with the Lord." Yeah. You know, you can imagine your, you know, your mother saying that to you, yeah, or, <laughs> or your grandmother, or your grandmother. Yeah, yeah, or, yeah. yeah. Well, right from the first time yeah. I listened, I thought, oh, "Okay, there's there's a hum I can hear," mm. um, but it wasn't caught up on the technical part of the mm. words. Yes. You know? Yeah. But it was through several different songs. I'm mm. thinking, there's something humming in behind here mm -hmm. that I'm sensing. Mm -hmm. that, oh, I wonder if I ever get the chance to ask that question. If that's where it's coming from. It is. So it's clearly on a more spiritual plane, mm. which means you guys are willing to wander into some of the, the shadows, mm -hmm. the shadow mm -hmm. work that humans need to do sometimes yeah. so they yeah. can find the light on the other side of the shadow. Well, yeah. and, and, th and that's it exactly, because I think a, a lot of the uh, the albums have darker elements but there there are also the the lighter um, the lighter side of it in terms of the realization that there's there's redemption and you you can say that it's a religious redemption but it sometimes it's, it's just it's spiritual personal realizing that no one has gone so far that they can't come back from you know or recover from what they've you know done or experienced you know yeah. so yeah thoughts yeah. Happy songs don't get to the root of the human condition, really. No. So you know you gotta <laughs> descend into the belly of the beast yeah. in order to be yeah. redeemed. Yeah. yeah, you know, and I mean, you know. I but, but that means <laughs> somewhere. Okay, I want to follow the string. Sure. It's fun, yeah. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Because somewhere along the way, each of you in your own lives have elements of that. Mm. Because music's so personal, especially mm. when you're playing and you're mm. sharing, because you're pulling it from here and it goes out. Mm. And then there's all of you organizing that together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So to go into the shadow spaces together, um, this might sound odd, but has there ever been moments when you're playing your own stuff, even without audience, you know, especially mm. without audience? And you you start to all feel it, and I don't know if you cry, but you get into that space all together, and it's like, Whoa. yeah, you know yeah, that yeah. just happened. Mm. Come to the end of the song, and you don't even remember having played it. Yeah, yeah but you mm. do have that kind of lingering feeling afterwards that you just did something that went beyond what you normally do. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that fascinating? It yeah. it is because it, it's, and as as the songwriter, you know, like, and just going back to that infant song you know uh you come in with 
with chords and words and you don't expect it to go somewhere or turn into something as as beautiful as as it becomes you know and uh and that's the product of everyone in the room not just you know the person who had the initial idea it's you know six people who created something out of that yeah Mm. the um there's so many different examples we can draw from movies Mm. because movies make it easy for us so Mm. there's this brian wilson film about beach boys and his tormented life but Mm -hmm. also in there was the magical process in that small little box of a recording studio Mm. and he'd hauled his brothers in and said i want to do this and they're like what's he thinking now Mm -hmm. and something would they managed to capture it on film Mm. there's something would happen at a certain point and they're all he could almost feel the vibration all goes click because mm-hmm. of their harmonies. Yeah. And you know, in our latest album, we, our, our previous albums, we've uh, kind of gone the typical recording route of laying down your bass tracks and stacking things on top of them in almost a mechanistic way because you're not all together when the process is happening. But with this album, we consciously set out to, uh, to do as much as we could live off the floor because we wanted, we feel like we do a good live show and we want to capture some of that energy yes. of, of yes. playing live together and you know getting into that state of sort of musical union with your other bandmates. So we recorded the bulk of this live off the floor. You know, We wanted to be able to play the album exactly as we had, had laid it down. And mm-hmm. we did do some overdubs and some cleanup and stuff afterwards, but yeah. the essence of that album is a is a live experience yeah yeah yeah. so it's it's kind of like uh and it's not to take away from some of the previous albums because we we you know very consciously tried to make them uh as as live feeling and and as full uh as as possible and very proud of everything that we've done but you know in in some cases especially for the the drummer and bass player who might be laying down the bed tracks it's it's probably like an actor with a green screen you know you know you you're going to you're going to get hit, you're going to get into this situation you're just going to uh hear the acoustic guitar but you've got to react as though the pedal steel the keys and the lead guitar are all here yeah. and all the backing vocals you know yeah. so you know make it as natural as possible <laughs> you've got to have a great imagination uh whereas this we we set up uh, largely in my basement, had an amplifier in every available room and had microphones fed to that and everybody was there with uh, their headphones on and, and actually listening to each other play while while yeah. we recorded. And looking so, at each other too, mm, I think. Yeah. yeah. So you get to feed off each other and communicate just that yeah. non-verbal communication. So. Yeah. Although if we hadn't have gone the other approach with the other albums, we wouldn't have had Decomposed. That's Maybe right. you tell Dennis a little bit about yeah. the process of because that was primarily something that Peter kind of assembled himself. Mm. So you were about to map out a concept album, or you shifted something? Yeah, well, it, it, it actually goes back to uh, May of, of this year. And uh, so Sugar Skull came out in October. But uh, this was probably the, the longest time uh, between albums, between Ignatius and uh, Sugar Skull. So it was three years. Typically, we have a two-year cycle. But we had a, a, a couple of... Uh, Know, stop starts with uh, with Sugar Skull as we you know tried to do the uh, the uh, original kind of lay bed tracks and lay layers yeah. on top of it and it wasn't quite feeling right so we knew that we had to go back and um, modify our, our process for it but in the meantime I, I started to um, go back into our older catalog and uh, and listen to the various layers of music that had been recorded there and John's right I mean we, we when we construct some songs and it's and it's adding that ear candy adding uh, a, a lot of the the textures and things that are in some ways almost imperceptible you, you miss it if it's not there but but it's it's buried and, and creates just uh, sort of some color underneath I started going back to some of the older uh, songs on on previous records, and I would, in trying to discover kind of what what made uh, some of those songs work and uh, and gel so well, I started doing things like pulling out the drums and pulling out the guitars, and as soon as you start pulling out uh, the drums and the guitars and even uh, the vocals, suddenly rising to the the forefront are all these beautiful keys and you know lush synthesizer parts and things of that nature that became music unto itself you know and and so back in may uh released uh an album 
that is fully instrumental, no vocals, no drums, uh, really spare use of guitars, but called it decomposed. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's wordplay, but at the same time, it's, it's taking the compositions and taking out the composition. So the guitar is gone, the vocals are gone, that, that were the, <laughs> the, the initial concept of, of those tunes, mm -hmm. and turned it into pieces of music that basically represents what the the rest of the band did with with the songs yeah. so. so we didn't record any additional tracks for that album we just stripped away existing ones yeah. was it powerful oh so, yeah, yeah yeah powerful for us to listen to something that i mean you go for a long time without listening to albums and you don't even remember the you know the entire tune per se but then when you strip away the other stuff there are parts there that i don't remember playing mm. You well, know, and, you and reacquaint <laughs> yourself with the yeah, and and to be fair, there there's a there, in recording, you create a lot of layers uh, of music that might not actually even be used. So there are situations in in decomposed where, uh, and it's because you know it just doesn't work for the composition. Yeah. It's it has still been recorded as we were going through the you know the process of discovering the tune and and experimenting. So they might not be in the final tracks that are on the previous albums, but when I started going through, I would, all right, I'm going to unmute that. And what is that? Oh, it's this bell sequence, you know, this arpeggio there. And it's like, that really works. You know, once you take away the drums and the guitars and the vocals, that really works. And so it's music that had been recorded and in some cases not being used. And I remixed to to create that, that composition out of the parts that were there. So. Yeah. Mm. Um, it reminds me a touch of um, if you're decorating a house and there's some people like to fill it with stuff mm -hmm. and it feels cozy. Yeah. And, all wrapped around. and then there's other people. <laughs> what if there was one chair sitting there? And yeah. suddenly that one chair has got so much power. Because mm -hmm. when you walk in that space, the space is so open and then there's one focal point. Mm -hmm. So it reminded me of that with physical dimensions to what you do musically. Yeah. Well, pull this out, pull this out, pull this out. Mm -hmm gets more spacious and like, oh the focus on what was left yeah. is phenomenal yeah. feng shui yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and, like that. and when we we're talking about the the way that we arrange music and things like that like i have i have melodies and when we get in with the the band um just saying how the the other musicians find counter melodies well you get into the the decomposed at aspect and you take out the melody suddenly that counter melody becomes the melody yeah. and and it's a completely different yeah. so it might be a harmony to what uh i would be singing or or what somebody is playing yeah. but you take out the uh the the main kind of hook and that counter melody becomes you know the focal point of the, yeah. of the music so mm. um Slightly different tack. Do you find uh, music connects people? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Do you have yeah, your own various levels too? Yeah. Your own connects experiences us as a band. That? It connects uh, connects us to the community in general, and uh, you know. Do you sense it when you're playing sometimes? Mm -hmm. With you yeah. know a, a live gig somehow, and, and you do something, and you see the reaction and. Oh yeah. yeah, and not always in an expected way too. The you know sometimes the songs that you think are really going to draw people in are not the ones that really excite them, but maybe uh, one of the quieter pieces. Or mm. I think we had that experience this weekend. We had two separate uh, shows and different songs. There was some overlap, of course, because we were playing you know all of the songs off of uh, Sugar Skull, and some of the songs off Sugar Skull the first night uh, appealed more to the audience than the second night. So it mm. was a different different profile like mm -hmm. our audience was different both nights they mm -hmm. came to see different guest musicians and mm -hmm. and we formatted the show differently and just the act of putting a song in a sequence with other songs in a different location makes that song kind of stand out in different ways it's kind mm -hmm. of like the idea of decompose you start rearranging the pieces and suddenly it means something different mm -hmm. so yeah we connect differently to the audience with different songs at different times, you know, in different contexts. Mm. Yeah. There's this great uh, clip on YouTube, um, Bobby McFerrin, called Pentatonic Scale. Yeah. Oh, okay. um, he's at a neuroscience convention. Yeah. <laughs> so you got all these suits up yeah, on stage, yeah, yeah. and Bobby McFerrin in his black tee and his skinny black jeans. And he gets up there, I won't do the whole thing, and I can't sing worth being so. <laughs> but so if you go watch Pentatonic Scale, Bobby McFerrin, he does da da and he's bouncing on a spot. The audience goes da 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 da. Then he goes one step over, the next note up da 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 da. And then 
after maybe 15 seconds of this, and he's bouncing back and forth, going da da da, and they're following. He goes to the third note, but doesn't say anything. Mm. Everyone hits the note automatically. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then they laugh. Yeah. yeah. And he explained afterward, and after after he's done like a 12 12 note minute and a half song with him doing that lovely mm. stuff he mm -hmm. does mm -hmm. while he's bouncing the, the keyboard part say and the audience is being the sound for that bounce yes right yeah. up to 12 notes up here and then down. It, he says no matter where i go in the world everyone knows this mm -hmm. yeah. no matter what language you know, everyone knows those notes it's and then of course the panel says you want a job in neuroscience because you just explained in three minutes <laughs> we'll mm -hmm. be analyzing mm -hmm. for a lifetime mm -hmm. yeah music is really a culture it's like like language really i mean people can complete sentences that people start because we're we're not just individual atoms kind of bouncing around mm -hmm. uh, we're a whole culture of people and we have conventions that we've learned you know since birth you know and uh, and music is the same way it just doesn't have words so the meaning is less uh, you know precise mm -hmm. but the melodies are there and uh, you know the harmonies are there all, all mm -hmm. of those things and uh, and people kind of anticipate something about to happen as much as they are sitting back and listening to it yeah fun thanks for that yeah i'm, yeah. I'm wandering off the path a little bit but you that guys you guys awesome. live in that world mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. so yeah. i want to follow it with you do you guys dream music yeah you know? yeah there's absolutely. A, like yeah. all over and then you can't explain to your partners like what are you doing <laughs> <laughs> well and, and sometimes you know i, I it, it sounds like one of these tropes, but you know, sometimes an idea for a song comes in your dream, yeah. and you, you you know, and well, and you and, and you wake up trying to you know grab onto it before it disappears, right? Yeah. You know, whether it's whether it's a lyric or a, or a melody, and uh, I've I've several times over you know all my many years have woken up uh, <laughs> trying to grab a guitar or write something down because I, I just dreamt it yeah. and uh, and hope that it wasn't something that I had heard somewhere before <laughs> <laughs> there's that yeah yeah because that theta state you know your brainwave goes into another state mm -hmm. and, and then a whole other thing can unfold and th that invites this is way off in another direction but that invites other layers of consciousness mm, other yeah. layers of knowing yes it's the yeah. original mashup <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's great <laughs> cosmic tunes original mashup. Yeah. Mm. Um, Your inner mixtape. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and when you mentioned mixtape earlier, I was thinking, oh, you guys will be on the next um, Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Wouldn't that be fantastic? Look for a sleepy driver. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you, you've you've talked to many many artists uh, uh, and who have different songwriting processes. But something that you've probably heard many many times before is that people who write music uh, or write songs. They probably it, have a, a handful of songs that they have no idea where the songs came from yeah. because they they came so quickly. Yeah. And I've had situations like that before, where uh, a tune, lyrics and and you know melody chords would come out just as fast as you know. So a three minute song might be written in you know ten minutes or something like that. And we've had situations with the band where um essentially the first time that we play it as a band would be you know what we would record a year later and it would be almost note for note because we're all tapping into this something that is it's almost like it's predetermined yeah. you know yeah, well, well you can slide it into collective conscience mm. just like you did mm. you know a cosmic mashup thing mm. yeah. and and that when you hit a certain state inside yourself but there's another element I want to introduce. Um, there's a book called The Acorn Theory by a fellow named Hillman. Mm -hmm. The notion that our soul is kind of preformed and then plunked into us, and then the rest of our life is trying to get to that original acorn that mm -hmm. was inside of us mm -hmm. to turn into oak tree. Um, so it, he's using that as a way of explaining why some people just seem to have to follow a certain path, mm -hmm. even though they're banged on every which way. About mm -hmm. you know Einstein doesn't know math very well, but look what he does. And yes, other yep. people like. And the dark side too, for, for where evil comes from, and mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. something about music might tap you into your original self. Mm -hmm. To then mm -hmm. it's got to come out, and you don't know where it comes from, but there it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I I completely I I understand you know that that fine line between genius and insanity, and I and I and <laughs> it's the and ability it's to communicate. Well, well, it it is because uh, you know 
I, I would not classify myself anywhere near a genius when it comes to, to music, or, but I understand it. I've glimpsed it enough that I understand what it means to strive for, you know, perfection, you know, in terms of whether it's a tune or, or uh, you know, a take or something like that. Mm -hmm. You get obsessed with uh, trying to turn something that's in your head into you know recorded form or something of that yeah, nature yeah. or with painting or whatnot i i understand you know you it's got to come out it, it has to come out and yeah. and it it it's never quite as perfect as it is in your brain right <laughs> so same yeah. thing for you i mean peter writes a fair amount of the songs and stuff but you're you're all part of the whole creative process. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to yeah. invite a little bit of insanity in your, yeah. <laughs> in yeah. your consciousness to some extent if you're, if you're going to be creative because you, you're not mm. repeating what's out there already. You're striving for something something new. So you push yourself out toward the edge, whether it's, you know, music or art or, mm. or writing. And, you know, there's a fine line between, I don't know, neuroses and <laughs> expression. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, well, um. The movie called Miles Ahead, with about Miles Davis. Yeah, um, yeah, it wasn't so much about his music, which is a typical discography or a mm, biography. Mm. It was about um, a bit of his shadow side, his drug addiction. And mm -hmm. a lovely movie because buried in there, there's moments where he's upstairs and he's got people playing downstairs, and he doesn't want to influence them because he wants them to find like their voice. Yes, mm -hmm. but it's a little bit crazy. The whole thing's got an edge to it. It's like, oh, you yeah. just dang. There's a great film by, uh, I think, Clint Eastwood uh, directed it about Thelonious Monk. I think it's called Monk, and okay. same thing. Monk gradually declined into total insanity, stopped playing music, and this yeah. charts, th charts that whole process, you know, yeah. that mm. combination of uh, absolute brilliance that, you know, kind of eclipses yeah. anyone out there. He's just developing a whole new genre of, of you know, jazz and piano playing, mm -hmm. and at the same time sort of sliding off the deep end. Yeah. Well, this is fun because I can segue that into to bass players, sort of. So some of my prep, I got. I wonder if these guys, <laughs> wonder if these guys have a favorite artist, and I, I you know, um, or somebody that just you go, wow, how'd they do that? Mm. Right? Mm. So for me, I had one of those wow moments uh, a while ago. Um, Jeff Beck was playing at Selwell Foot Belgium at Montreal Montreal Jazz Festival, mm -hmm. so it was a major treat to even be there, and you know, fifteen hundred other people. Yeah. yeah. But. His young lady, who is the bass player, um, Tal Wilkenfeld, mm -hmm. 18 or 19, mm -hmm. got a couple of those kind of muscle shirts on. Yeah. I hate the name White Beater, but it's like the old yes, men's yeah, t-shirt, yeah, you know? Yeah. And her khakis, her camel, camel things, crazy hair. She was insane. Mm. And all I could think of after was, uh, imagine being her dad. 14-year-old mm. kid says, I want to play jazz bass with Jeff Beck when I yeah. <laughs> just Just out of high school and maybe didn't even complete yeah. it. Just yeah. went on that path. The only person in our high school knows who Jeff Beck is. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> there's something in there. And I thought, wow, man, you just, you just hit me, like right there. Mm. Yeah. Do you guys have versions of that? For where music just came in and went pop, and I'm not saying you aspire to that, mm. but just something that really resonated for you with with someone. Well, I think uh, it's a tough one. Yeah, it is. It, 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 probably it, fifty. It, it there, yeah, and and I think that you know, as far as my songwriting, it would be the product of my influences. Uh, although I don't think that anybody could easily connect the dots like if they look at my record collection they would maybe not or or the music that i listened to over the years would not see a direct co correlation with uh sleepy driver you know like yeah, yeah. How, how did you get from here to here you know well, and, well that's because everybody's involved with sleepy driver yes well yeah. and but but even the tunes themselves uh you know at some you get a country sounding song yeah. and uh and people say well you know you you played reggae in in university or you know you were listening to uh goth in high school and stuff like that mm -hmm. it's like how do you, how did you get here and you know we're just the product of our influences i th i think more than more than anything else when i'm trying to write or or we're working on music i actually consciously don't listen to anything yeah. you know like yeah. i don't because i i don't want it to seep in and and you know yeah. kind of pollute that you know a little bit with someone else yeah. in there but there there are tons of artists that you know are in here and you feel it mm. 
moments? Yeah. Do you have Do you have moments, or even one yeah. story where something crawled inside your bones and go, "Whoa!" Is that mm. the well, I, I have a number, a number <laughs> of stories like that, really. But but I do. I, in grade eleven, I had this fantastic high school music teacher, and he was not, you know, the music by rote sort of teacher. He loved music. He was a multi instrumentalist, and he had a deep appreciation of music across all genres. And one of his approaches was to play play music in class from all kinds of different you know areas and just get us interested in listening to different things so basically train our mind to listen mm. to something not top 40 so i mean i can remember him putting in uh, the the yes album fragile and listening to that and going, wow that is like rock music like i've never heard before nice and loud. Yeah. Mm. miles davis this is a uh, bitches brew yeah you, you put in like music that like you can't even <laughs> couldn't even compute at the time but it sort of stuck in your head john coltrane yeah. uh, thelonious monk you know i and i had come from a classical piano background which is pretty you know structured st structured straight ahead and it was an easy jump from that to jazz because it was instrumental and easy jump from that to uh like prog rock because mm. it was very heavily classically influenced and there was a lot of attention on music but those are uh, i really remember that that year of of hearing all of these things and and boring lps from uh from him and, and that that was a that was a time when you didn't have access to the musical library mm. that you do now mm. right you just yeah. stumbled upon your musical influences yeah. if you're lucky you had like an older brother or a friend with an older brother with mm -hmm. a, a big collection of lps and and that's how you learn music just mm -hmm. it was totally trial and error you know kids today don't realize how lucky they are they, they have access to like you know, <laughs> a world of music yeah, <laughs> yeah. that we don't so i mean they can they can be exploratory in ways that we couldn't before I grew up in a small town too. We didn't even have a music store. Mm. We had stores that would have little little music sections. So it yeah. was hard to find music and and people in your life who loved music and and had strange types of music that you could, you know, borrow or listen to. I mean that that was important in that day and time. And yeah. that that was you know and that almost goes back to the album covers because you'd sit and read them while you're listening. Yeah, to the music. yeah, you'd have it's like, true. And then the you'd, album notes. You'd and find out who played with who, played with who, and then you find their name crossed over. Yeah, and played with someone. Yeah. And, and the jazz albums in particular, the the notes were you know they were a form of poetry or expression, right? Mm. People took their liner notes seriously, mm -hmm. like they wrote about it in the same way that you would write about a you know a piece of classic literature or, or a poem, mm. like they were yeah. eloquent statements about yeah. what that music meant. An essay, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah Keith Jarrett's wonderful yeah. at doing that on the mm. CCM stuff. Yeah. yeah, I I I do love the memories though of uh, and I'm and I'm not sure I haven't really figured out whether kids do it nowadays or not. But I can remember sitting around with you know two or three of my friends and you put on an album <laughs> and you'd all just sit there and and listen to it from and you were smoking in it. Right? Well, no, no, no <laughs> but but uh, <laughs> older. <laughs> I'd say no. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> but the but you would you would just sit there and you'd put it on side one track one and and let it play through yes. and and everybody was just sitting there just listening to the whole thing and and experiencing the the album and I I know that my son does that to a to a certain degree uh, with with a couple of his friends and it's it's a really a joy to 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 see him explore discover and and experience music but I, i'm not sure if that's still something that happens with the younger generation you know that that whole immerse yourself in in yeah. an album or and two. listening yeah. with a capital l mm. you know, yeah. they're very present and in it mm -hmm. yeah some of the music needs to lend itself to that so mm -hmm. i can remember you know driving out of montreal over the champlain bridge on a warm summer night listening to show my fam introduce super mm -hmm. and and you had to stop and well not stop but you mm. had to stop kind of and listen yeah. to it because yeah. it sucked you in and, and that almost crossed over on not quite poppy but it was still a, the first one was still kind of a concept album they walked you from a to b to c mm -hmm, through mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and nowadays it's like one here one there one there yeah. the idea of a concept album is maybe something of, of the past when you have more of a playlist yeah. so you know the concept is something that the user brings to it and they yeah. construct a playlist out of various types of artists but yeah the idea of actually laying out a sequence of songs that aren't complete in and of themselves but you know, straddle an entire side yeah. of an album or an entire yeah. album. But it is yeah. fun sometimes on YouTube. Uh, you go back on Pink Floyd. And oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about Dark Side of the Moon. When yeah. I, yeah. 
good fun. Um, yeah. <laughs> we have a couple minutes left, and then yeah. I'd love to end with another video clip. Sure. Um, so how would you like to end? And then at the end of that, could you intro the next uh, piece that you brought for us? Yeah, the audience I, I'm, I'm trying so to think about what uh, what tell. videos I put on yeah. there. Well, while you're thinking, uh, you can, like, how do you want to send this off? What's uh, anything we didn't touch on? Probably a thousand times. <laughs> we touched on so much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but just final, final thoughts for what do you want the audience to leave with other than go uh, pick up a copy or download a copy or... Or listen to this song for local music and mm, yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah, like how important it is to really, even though like music is so global now, it's still important to support local artists and you know buy, the, buy their merchandise. You know, pay for their shows. Mm -hmm. so there are a lot of struggling musicians out there. Yeah. Who, well, it, it, it it's true because you know people actually paying for for art is what makes art possible. Hmm. You know, mm -hmm. because yeah. if if people can't, you know generate some sort of income from it then you yeah. know they'll move away from it yeah. if there's a local artist that you love buy stuff from them mm -hmm. you know that's the the most important thing that you can do to support the music scene you know otherwise they're going to work a nine to five job and not be able to tour <laughs> <laughs> you know or raise their family and yeah and, and <laughs> a little bit of rage built inside <laughs> no, no no but it's it's valid though because it's true yeah, yeah and we never wandered into politics or economics mm. right but that hovers on the side because there's a lot of paradigm shifts going on right now there's a lot of upheaval going on in large systemic changes mm -hmm. um, yeah. politics wise people are kind of fed up and they're starting to wake up. Mm. It's the artists who always lead us through major moments of transition, mm -hmm, social yeah. change. Mm -hmm. There's a whole other theme that oh, there is. Yeah. in yeah. there about. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why supporting local artists is so important so they can keep doing what they do because mm -hmm. five true. years from now, someone's going to be helping us through and it's not going to be with words. Mm -hmm. it, well, you know, to a degree. Yes, but yeah, there's something yeah. about music that pulls people together and... Yeah. Artists make money for their, from their shows and their merchandise these days. They don't make money from albums. Very few people have record contracts, and when they do, they're usually very, you know, they're, they're very difficult to, like only the top tier musicians are making any substantial amount of money from their albums. Mm -hmm. Even like common names that you, that you hear, people are doing music full time, touring with record deals. They're not necessarily making much money. The, the, yeah. A lot of them are making money from performance and merchandise yeah. or or endorsements, yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. that, those those types of things. Yeah. Um, you know, so brands that are trying to capitalize on, you know, the the artist brand. Yeah. You know, yeah. sponsored by Pepsi or you know. Yeah. Yeah. You can go see a band and spend uh, you know, forty dollars on four or five beer, then you can buy their album or buy a T-shirt yep. or mm -hmm. contribute to their Indiegogo campaign or. Show some some form of support to the people who really really need it. There are people out there who are doing cross Canada tours, and they don't make sense. They lose money doing that, right? And that's that's not a great, you know, statement about the music industry. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. you know, at the same time, the technology has freed people from. Uh, it's made music more accessible and made it freer. It's it, there isn't an economic model out there at the moment that is you know, a guarantee that people who are working hard at it, producing good music, are going to see any kind of compensation. And we're not even talking about the kind of compensation that makes you rich or even yeah. mildly, you know, able to sustain your life. We're talking about minimal com compensation. You know, yeah. mm. you've got the a bag on your back and you're kind of staying at people's houses as you as you tour through cities and a lot of the time you're playing to 10, 20 people at a bar and you know, maybe four or five shows in an entire tour are really going to hit that kind of numbers and the reception and yeah. and see any kind of turnaround. Mm. So, yeah, that That is the state. It's, it's probably always been the state to some extent. To, to some degree. Until you guys do a live nude album or something. Like <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're saying Sorry. <laughs> okay, why well, we give these guys a yeah. brand shift here? <laughs> that that, that might <laughs> really decrease support in the long run. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the analytics on that. <laughs> Gate full vinyl. <laughs> Good. We've got uh, on videos. I'm just thinking. Uh, <laughs> Which well, well, we don't have any else. Anything else from Sugar Skull on okay. there? But we have. Uh, so my kind is there, which is a trio tune, trio yeah. video, and uh, get right with the Lord, which is the live video. Yeah. Which Which one do you want to send us off with? 
Yeah, I think get right with the Lord since we we talked about yeah. religious metaphors. Yeah, and, uh, that would yeah. be a good one, and it also like has a good sense of our live performance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, all right. Thank you. Do you have final thoughts to send us out? Sure. Well, thanks very much, Dennis, for having yes, us. I mean, it, it, it seems like we just barely scratched the surface on on yeah. this. And if you ever want yeah. to do a part two, yeah. let us know. Yeah. Um, I I know that uh, with some of the videos that we have, get right with the Lord from a live performance last year is is on there. So I think you can you know let people hear the tune and uh, and see us uh, at our best. Great. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks. This yep. is great. Thanks for playing along. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> great. Thank you for watching. Be good. Have fun. Love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon. <laughs>